Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Evangelical Free Church. I'm Pastor Desmond So. Join with me as we go through this last psalm on this series that we are going through for the last three months. Today we'll be covering from Psalm 2. So if you have your Bibles with you, get your Bibles ready and let us study Psalm 2. Welcome again. I wish that we can go on and on in this series, which I've entitled, Dwelling into the Heart of God. But today will be our very last psalm that we'll be covering. I hope that this entire series has brought you a lot of joy, helped you to understand the heartbeat of God as we dwell into His Word to discover His heartbeat. Today, we will end off all the way back to the beginning, Psalm 2. And now some of you may be wondering, why do I want to end off with Psalm 2 and not perhaps Psalm 150? If you remember the very first sermon which I've started, Psalm 1, I said if I had a choice, I would rather cover Psalm 1 and 2 as one single psalm. There's a reason why I do that. Because Psalm 1 and 2 really begins with this idea of blessings. In fact, someone says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And Psalm 2 ends off again with this whole idea of being blessed. Psalm 2 verse 12 says, Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So, in many ways, this is what we call an inclusio. It begins in Psalm 1, verse 1, and ends with Psalm 2, verse 12. And the entire two Psalms really is a reflection of the entire Psalter. And it is like the book ends of the 150 Psalms. And today, we are going into Psalm 2 to discover for ourselves about what God wants us to do. Someone begins with the blessings that we will get individually when we choose to follow God. Some two talks about more global things, where someone's individual, some two is global. And some two tells the nations, the people, God's creation, that we too can experience this blessing when we choose to follow God and to follow His ways. So without further much ado, let's go to Psalm 2 and let me read for you the first three uh, verses. Psalm 2 verse 1 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed saying. Let us burst their bones apart and cast away their cords from us. Where someone tells us that we will be blessed if we choose to walk in God's paths and not in the paths of the wicked, the scoffers, the sinners. Some two paints for us all the nations together and tells us about their foolishness and their vanity. And the question for us to answer today is this. Why should we follow after God? Why should we choose His path? And in Psalm 2, Psalm 2 in fact gives us even more hints about how to follow this God. And Psalm 2 tells us specifically, in fact, to follow after God's anointed or God's Messiah. In fact, the word anointed and Messiah are actually the same. Or God's chosen one, His Son. And clearly, God is telling us that we have a choice. The question that we have asked ourselves is, why? Why should we submit, obey, follow after God? And this Psalm, Psalm 2, gives us Four good, solid reasons why. In fact, Psalm 2 is given to us in four different scenes or four different acts, each of about three verses. Verses 1 to 3, verses 4 to 6, verses 7 to 9, and verses 
10 to 12. Four solid reasons why we should submit and obey after God and His anointed one. In fact, Psalm 2 is so much quoted in the New Testament. 60%, some scholars say, 60% of Psalm 2 is actually found in the New Testament. And while we do not know who the author of Psalm 2 is, the New Testament in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4 verses 25 to 26 tells us that this psalm was attributed to King David. In fact, King David is also known as the anointed one. He's really the real first king, not King Saul, but God's chosen king for the, Ish, for the people of Israel, for his chosen people. And Psalm 2 is commonly also known as coronation psalm because it is really a psalm that is sung out or read out during a king's coronation. But there is a problem. The problem is the nations and the people of the nations are raging against God. And they are not choosing God's ways, neither are they following after His anointed ones, His chosen Messiah for you and I. And so, the first reason why we should submit to God and serve His anointed is because our arrogance is vain. Let me say that one more time. It is because our arrogance is vain. And you may be saying, what do you mean by arrogance? How is it so? Uh, show me where is this arrogance? Well, the psalmist begins interestingly with a question. Why? In fact, we do not read the word why, but there are actually four whys here in the first two verses. He says, why do the nations rage? And why do the people plot in vain? And why do the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed ones? See, the psalmist is puzzled. He is confused. Or perhaps he is scratching his head. Why would people want to choose to do that? Why would they want to go against God? But you may be asking, how? How, how are they going against God and not submitting to Him, not serving Him? Well, you see, this is that declaration of independence. Verse 3 is a summary of that. He says, let us, cut, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away the cords from us. So they are gathering together, collectively going against God. Their arrogance was really trying to, to tell this creator God, this all-powerful God, that, you know what, we don't want you. It's shown through, through the series of things that they do. They rage against God. They, they plot against God. They are set up against God. They take counsel uh, together against God rather than to... Take God's counsel. In fact, those words, raging, plotting, setting up, and all, are very graphic. The word rage is the only time that is appearing here. I know in English, in other parts of the Old Testament, it appears several times. But this word ragesh is actually very unique. It's only one time that it appears here. And it's basically saying that they are collectively giving an uproar. It is almost as if though every single nation and people are going against God at one time. It, it paints for us a picture, isn't it? That final battle, that Armageddon, or the final Armageddon, where people will fight against God. But more about that later. But first, these people rage against God and they plot. They plot. The word plot has the idea of muttering, of gossiping, of murmuring, of growling. And, and in fact, it has this animistic picture of people behaving like animals, growling against God. And not only do they 
rage and growl against God, plot against God. They set up themselves against God. That means they basically take an entrenched position. They take a stand. That's what it literally means. Set up means they literally take a position and they are stubborn. They don't want to change. And there's a play of words here, really, of those set up and take counsel. In the original language, let me read for you. It, is, it basically says, you are set, which is set up, and you are set. You hardly can hear the difference, right? But you are set and you are set itself, take counsel, seems to suggest together, if you put those two together, it sounds as if though they are already taking a stance, they are entrenched, and the word take counsel means to put foundation which buttress the idea of being entrenched. They are putting a foundation, they're establishing themselves together, collectively against God. Now, if that is not arrogance, I do not know what is arrogance to me. So they are arrogant against God. But is it just against God? Well, verse 2b tells us it is not just against God, but against His anointed. The idea of anointed one has the idea of being a king, being the chosen one, being the one who is being blessed. And if you go against God, you're going against His anointed. And the psalmist is telling, in fact, confused and saying, why? Why do you even want to do that? Why? And in fact, he says that these things, verse 1 tells us, are in vain. It's vanity. It is it's being foolish. Uh, it is like, if you want to fight against God, it's like you want to box against Mike Tyson. Uh, or you want to play hoops against Michael Jordan. Or you want to run the mile against Chipoge, who ran the marathon under two hours, or you want to maybe uh, play soccer and, and score against Messi, or perhaps you want to argue about quantum physics with Einstein, or you want to uh, have a cook-off against Gordon Ramsay. Should I go more? Oh, or perhaps you, you want to sing off like uh, against Pavarotti, or perhaps you want to paint off against Da Vinci. See, it's absurd. It is vain. It's ridiculous. It's to the point whereby anyone reading this, if they have a fear of God, if they know that there is a God, they'll say that this is ridiculous. I remember as a young boy, I, I loved to you know, <laughs> wrestle with my cousins. And I have this big, huge cousin, all right, from my father's third older sister. And his age and my age wasn't that far apart, but six years apart. And I remember Abeng is his name, and I'm Atai, right? So Abeng and Atai likes to fight. As a five-year-old boy, I was a tiny, puny little boy. And Abeng is quite a bully. <laughs> In fact, whenever I tried to punch him, if I did manage to punch him, oh, he would get mad and he would just grab me by my collar. And get, he can literally shake me. You know, or he will put his whole body weight against me and I, no matter how much I wrestle against him, I can never turn him over or win against him. Abeng can literally put out his hand, stretch out his hand and I will be doing this, trying to box him, I can never reach his body. Now, this picture is very graphic. I know it's ridiculous and this is the picture that's painted here. It's ridiculous. It's vain. That arrogance against God is vain. And why should we submit to Him? Why should we serve this God? Because our arrogance, no matter how good we are, is all in vain. We can never outsmart God. We can never outrun God. We can never outdo Him. Which is why you and I should serve Him and to submit to Him. But that is not the only reason why the psalmist tells us to submit and serve God. There's another reason. The second reason is found in the next act or the next scene, verses 4 to 6. Let me read for you verses 4 to 6. It says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. 
Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now the scene changes from the earth to the heavens. I, I want you to know that the psalmist is intentional in choosing his words. Here is the foolishness, the vanity of the, the people on earth. And here is God lifted high in heaven, speaking down to his creation. And God now speaks. But before he speaks, the psalmist paints for us his posture and his might and his power. And the second reason why you and I should submit to him, to obey him and to serve him is because God is all powerful. God is all powerful and is victorious. Why do I say God is all powerful and victorious? Notice his position. He is in heaven. We are on earth. Notice that he is sitting down while the nations were raging and going about found, finding their own allegiance and all that. And not only just that, God is laughing. I know some of us may not like the idea of a God who laughs. But you know something? The psalmist didn't sugarcoat God in any way. He knows the foolishness, the vanity of man, and which is why God simply laughs that you're trying so hard. You're like a mosquito. I could just crush you if I want to. And so this is an all-powerful God. And this all-powerful God is victorious because he's now calmly sitting on his throne in heaven. Now, as the nations were raging and, and, and deliberating and trying to connive and conceive wicked plans against God, God calmly sits in heaven. When you are facing an attack, when you have threats, I don't know about you, but most people do run or at least try to fight. But here the psalmist paints for us that serenity, that, that sovereignty of God. And he sits there and he laughs, laughs at the actions. And in fact, it says he holds them, literally he cages them in derision. It's useless. And who are you to even try to do this? It's what the psalmist is trying to say here. And now we hear God speak. Verse 3, the first act ends with the conversation or the speech of men. And the speech of men is a speech of declaration of independence. It's a speech of arrogance. It's a speech of trying to fight against God. Verse 3 says, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Interestingly, they recognize that God is in the plural their bonds, their courts. They don't see God as a protector and provider. They see God as a dominator, as someone who is trying to have dominion over them and they didn't like it. Verse 3 is where man speaks. But then verse 6 is when God speaks. And what did God say? As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. From the depths of the earth to the heights in heaven, now we move to Zion, Jerusalem, God's holy inhabitation. Now, if you remember what I've been saying throughout this whole series, I've been saying that the Psalms are a collection of uh, songs to be sung out, by the people of God. And then this, I believe, is collected during uh, the exile. And in fact, it was consolidated just after the exile when they returned back to the promised land after many years in captivity by the Babylonians and first by the Assyrians. Now, think for a moment. They are now declaring God's sovereignty and power. And the psalmist is reminding the people of Israel 
just as they remembered that they were formerly captives of the Babylonians, Assyrians, and all the people who are trying to take their land from them, right now they probably, when the psalmist sings this psalm out to his people, the people of Israel probably will remember their bondage. They remember those nations who were trying to bully them. And they remember now, and they are assured now, that God is in control. Even, even if they have another sovereign power over them, a puppet king over them, like the time when 2,000 years ago, the Romans were in charge. And so therefore, they realize that even though it seems as if they, li they live in bondage, they live in a dire situation, God is still sovereign. God is still all-powerful. And God has the last laugh. And why should they serve this God? Why should they submit to Him and not to the other kings and other nations around them? It is because God is all-powerful. And... He is victorious. He sits on his throne. He's established in his throne. And which is why the psalmist invites his people, just as he invites you and I today, to submit to this God and to submit to his son, his anointed son. So the first reason is because our arrogance is in vain. And the second reason is because God is all-powerful and victorious, which is why we need to serve Him and we need to submit to Him. But is there any other reasons? Are there any other reasons which we need to know based on this psalm in order for us to submit to Him? And this is where the scene changes again. The scene changes from earth to heaven to Zion. And now we see this back to the earth again. And this is when God declares certain things. God declares that He has a plan for His people, those who submit to Him. And this is found in verses 7 to 9. Let me read for you verses 7 to 9. It says, I will tell of the decree, the psalmist says, I will tell of the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Here we see the third reason why we should submit and to serve this God. The third reason given to us is because God's anointed, His chosen one, God's anointed will be vindicated. Whereas the first is about the laughable actions of men and the nations and the kings, and God has the laughter. Now we talk about the Messiah. And who is this Messiah? This Messiah is the one that's chosen by God. He says, in fact, that this Messiah is not just chosen by God, it is literally God's Son. And today I have begotten you. Echoing passages in the New Testament. Again, remember I said that Psalm 2 is quoted many times in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 13, verses 33, uh, the people remember that this verse in, in the second Psalm. And in fact, it is also quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5. And Hebrews again. Uh, chapter 5, verse 5 as well. Three times in the New Testament, this very verse, you are my son, today I have begotten you, is quoted. Therefore, signifying that the people of God, the church, early church, recognizes that this son is who? This son is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When the Word became flesh and dwelt with us. And this it is a, it's a son who is now in control of the earth. This is the son whom God has anointed. This is a son who will be vindicated. And why do I say that this is a son who will be vindicated? Notice in verse 9. Verse 9 says, You, referring to the son, 
shall break them, the nations who are opposed against God, you shall break them with rod of iron and dash them like dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Again, this idea of having this rod of iron and using that rod of iron to dash the people signifies the certainty, the concreteness and the definiteness of God's Son, His anointed, winning over and being vindicated over His oppressors. And this idea, in fact, is repeated or at least alluded in Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, Revelation 12, verse 5, and Revelation 19, 15. Now, we know the book of Revelation is the very last book. It talks about the second coming of Christ, the final battle or the Armageddon, which I mentioned earlier. And this whole idea of the nations raging against God's anointed one and God's anointed one winning over them, being vindicated over them, is shown here as as, as if though an iron rod smashes a potter's vessel. There's no way clay can fight against, or a porcelain can fight against iron. And certainly we see that God's Son is being vindicated. And why do I use the word vindicated? You see, in the New Testament, we know that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God's chosen one, God's only son, was crucified. Not because of his sins, because he had none. Not because that he had done something wrong or against the Romans' rules. He was crucified for the sins of the world due to the jealousy, the raging, the plotting. Does this sound familiar? The taking of counsel, the setup. Of his own people. Does that sound familiar to you? And if you recall the kangaroo courts that Jesus had to go through, the suffering that he had to go through, you will realize that the people, the nations, the Pharisees, the rulers of Israel in those days, in fact Rome itself, thought that they have removed this threat. They thought they have won. But no, no, no. In the end, Jesus had the last laugh. In the end, he will be like the rod smashing against the plots. Like clay, they will be thoroughly scattered and smashed. In fact, the world doesn't want this Messiah. It didn't receive this Messiah. Let me read for you John chapter 1. The Gospel of John is replete, filled with this imagery. John chapter 1 verses 10 and 11 says, He was, referring to the Messiah, He was in the world and the world was made through Him. Yet, yet, the world did not know Him. He came to His own, His fellow Jews, and His own people did not receive Him. And if you were to go to verse uh, chapter 3, verses 19 and following, it says here, And this is judgment. There you go. This is the judgment. The light, referring to Jesus, has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Why should we serve Him? Why should we submit to God's anointed? It is because God's anointed will be vindicated one day, someday. For you and I here, if we are Christians, we know the end of the story. Yes, we may still be in the world. And it certainly, it doesn't seem as if the God is winning. We see genocide, we see suicide, we see the whole world in chaos, the whole world literally in a pandemic, the world burning, the fires of California. And if you remember earlier this year, the fires in Australia, the whole creation seems to be groaning, nations raging after nations, but ultimately they are raging against God. But you know something? God has a last laugh. Because God will be victorious. Remember? Why should we you know, serve Him, submit to Him? 
Our arrogance is in vain. And God is all-powerful and victorious and is anointed is or will be vindicated. In fact, he is already vindicated when Jesus, who died on the cross, rose again on the third day to have victory over sin and death. And that was not only just witnessed by a few people, but witnessed by many, thousands. But the story doesn't end there. There's a fourth reason why the psalmist tells us that we should submit to this anointed one. And this anointed one we know is Jesus Christ. The fourth reason why we should submit to him and serve him is because our actions, what we do, what we say, our actions will be validated. Now you may be thinking, what do you mean by will be validated? From the scene of the earth, we move to the heavens. Then we go to God's throne on the hill on Zion and then back to the earth. Now we go back to his throne again. Now this is a picture of God's enthroned anointed one, his son, his promised Messiah, sitting on the throne, judging against the living and the dead, against the nations that rage against him. And here in verses 10, he says, now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Here the sin changes to a king who is now enthroned on his throne and making judgment. Now that he has smashed all those who are against him, now the psalmist pulls back and calls, appeals, almost pleading to the world, to the nations, to, to his people. He says, now, therefore, now that you know that God will win one day, someday, now that you know that God is all-powerful, now that you know that all our actions are in vain, now that you know that God's anointed, He will be vindicated. Now, therefore, O kings, now, therefore, O you foolish people, oh, now, therefore, what is He asking them to do? Be wise. Be wise, and not only just be wise, be warned. You better watch out, <laughs> be, be careful, be warned, O rulers of the earth. And what are you supposed to do? Verse 11 tells us, serve the Lord. And he didn't stop there. He says, serve the Lord with fear, with fear and trembling. Why? Because he's so powerful. He's so holy and he's going to judge one day, someday. So therefore, serve, which is why I say, why should we serve him? Why should we submit to him? There you go. Serve him. It's a command. Serve him with fear. But this fear is not the kind of fear that you're afraid of all the time, as if though he, he, he's going to be a capricious God, a God who, who, who is not predictable. You fear him because of his awesomeness. You fear him because you know that he will judge. You fear him because he's all holy. That's why we fear him. In contrast to our sinful nature. That's why we fear him. And it says here, and rejoice with trembling. Again, the idea of fearing by which But why fear and rejoicing are put together? Why, why is this put together? And verse 12 even says, kiss the sun. You, 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 you must be thinking, what does this kissing the sun mean? Well, the idea of kissing the sun is the idea of a, a sovereign and a vessel. Someone who is a boss and a slave or a servant. You see, when you lose a battle, usually you pay tribute. And one of the ways which when, when the people go and king loses, he will bow before the victor, 
the, the sovereign and, and the one who lost is called the vessel. The vessel will literally prostrate and kiss the feet of his victor. And in this case, kiss the son has this imagery of complete submission. This is not just a complete submission and just on face value. This is a total submission to a king because this king will validate all that we do. And he says, least he be angry. There's a trap there. Least he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled like a fire, the imagery of a fire. If you are not careful the moment he blows on it, the fire bursts into combustion. And so therefore, be careful, be fearful. But the best thing is this, for those who are careful and fearful and respectful and do proper homage to this God, to His anointed one, guess what? It ends off with verse 12 the, towards the end. There is a blessing. It says, Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. What a beautiful picture to end this entire psalm. It is not just about us. It's not just about me, I, myself. It is all about God. It is a picture of blessedness when we choose to follow after God. Do we choose to follow after God? Have you done so today? Many of us may think that, yeah, I believe in, in Him and His Son and all that. But do our lives reflect the obedience, the submission? Do we genuinely believe in His Anointed One? Blessed, the idea of blessed is the idea of being approved, being vindicated, being validated. Which is why I said our actions will be validated. And the message for you and I here today is this, that we need to go to the Messiah to come before Him in humility, to worship Him, to serve Him, and to submit to Him. If you have not done that, may I strongly suggest to you to do so today. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you again for this psalm. And as we end off this series, I know that Lord, we have learned so much about what your heartbeat is all about. You do not wish that all of us will continue in our sins and perish. This psalm ends with hope of blessings. This psalm ends with the idea that you desire us to be restored back to a right relationship with your Son, your Anointed One. So help us, Father God, to live our lives that's pleasing to you in obedience to your Word by following after your Son. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you.